For a decade, the nation's military leadership have talked about the need for innovative technology and how to inject it faster into doctrine and operations. Published reports detail, though, how little the Defense Department actually spends on new or startup companies, even ones that have what the military says it's looking for. For some insight, we turn to people with experience at the Pentagon and in startups. Lisa Hill is Director of Investor Relations and Engagement at Shield Capital. Ms. Hill, good to have you with us. Thank you. Glad to be here. And Michael Brown is a partner at Shield Capital. Mr. Brown, good to have you. Great to be here as well. Thank you for having us. And you are both former employees, and Michael, you are the director of the Defense Innovation Unit, so you know where of you speak. Let's begin a little bit. Just give us a brief summary of what Shield Capital is all about. Sounds like the name Shield puts you in that space. Sure. So, you know, Shield Capital is really set up to capitalize on the convergence of these market trends in both commercial technology and national security and really able to leverage the specialist approach to venture capital investing, which is deep understanding in a technical domain and also the value added advantage that we're able to bring to our portfolio companies within their market strategies. And so Shield Capital is really at the forefront of looking into what are the companies building and what are the applications in both markets and will they be able to scale? How will we be able to be part of that success for those young companies? And Michael, putting on your former DIUX hat, you dealt with a lot of these companies. They brought things to you. There was OTA, you know, other transaction authority money to maybe get prototypes. What's your experience with the degree to which they ended up doing business with the Pentagon? And how did you try to inculcate them both in the procurement system and in what it takes to deliver at military scale, let's say? Yeah, well, I think uh, you're right, uh, Tom. Using the other transaction authority, we're able to bring folks in quickly and put them on contract and then start to test their solution in a military uh, application. So let's test and see how they work. And then those that were successful got put on a contract. I think a pretty good success rate. I think DIU was able to, at the time I left a year and a half ago, achieve a 50% transition rate. That means for every project you start, 50% result in a production contract for one of the vendors. So a we were able to bring in over 100 new vendors to DOD. The question is, okay, how big are those production contracts? And to your point, starting out in your introduction, what percentage of that is of a Pentagon spending is that? So that's where I think we still have some room to room to grow. But DIU was able to prove that we could bring new vendors in and they could begin to scale. Well, would it also be accurate to say that even a small amount of spending could have a lot of, I don't know, catalyzing effect? For example, the startups aren't building battleships at $12 billion a piece, but there is something that for a million dollars could completely change the way a battleship operates or a carrier operates. I'm making that example up, but I think that's probably what was more in mind, fair to say? It's exactly right. So the replicator program, which wants to deliver thousands of uh, attributable autonomous systems to Indopaycom, you could get 2.6 million drones for the cost of one aircraft carrier. So you're right. It's a completely different scale in terms of what you can buy for taxpayer dollars. And we saw a number of vendors, whether it was uh, C3.ai, Shield AI, separate from Shield Capital, uh, obviously Anduril. We saw a number of vendors start to scale, and now they've gone on to do large contracts beyond what we were able to help them achieve at DIU. Yeah. So then the aggregate sales of this industry, I guess no one can really tell for sure. It's hard to pull that data out. But One published report said it was only 1% of DOD spending. Do you feel that's accurate or could it be more than that? I think it's pretty accurate. I think, you know, the vendors that uh, DIU was able to introduce were achieving around $5 billion in contract value at the same time that the Pentagon would have bought a trillion dollars worth of gear. Now, to your earlier point, it's much more expensive to buy an aircraft carrier or fighter aircraft, but there's still a lot of room to move for these new innovative capabilities from non-traditional vendors. So 1% is too small. It will never be 50%, but that shows that there's, there's quite a bit of headroom to bring in new capabilities at lower prices for DOD. We're speaking with Michael Brown. He's a partner at Shield Capital and with Lisa Hill, the Director of Investor Relations and Engagement at Shield Capital. Both are formerly with the Defense Innovation Unit. And Lisa, what's your criteria? What do you look for specifically in a company, not just the technology that they're developing? And by the way, is it only software or is it also hardware types of items? And beyond the technology itself, what does it take for you to say, yeah, this is worth investing in? 
So I think, so Shield Capital looks in uh, four domains specifically. So we are in artificial intelligence, autonomy, cybersecurity, and space. In fact, just earlier to this week, we had one of our portfolio companies, Apex Space Manufacturing, had a successful launch on the SpaceX Transporter 10, breaking a world record for speed from design sheet into orbit. And so we are in both software and also hardware. And I think that that diversity is really important because Hardware is capital intensive. If you have that balanced portfolio with the software, the SaaS opportunities, the, the enablement opportunities, and, and then that's that's a really uh, important strategy for us. And that's the way that we sort of think about that that balance. But that's not why we would make decisions. And I think, and I'll, I'll turn it over to Mike here, but you know, even in the way that we look at investing and in the way that we are approach in three real ways, the team, the technology, and the timing. And that is, is this team the right team to solve this problem? Have they worked together? Do they understand what it takes to start a business to, to really take this innovation to the next level? And the timing, is the market right? This might be a really great idea. Is the market right to be able to take this and scale it? Is there a customer? Are there customers? Customer traction is critical for our evaluation. And then technology. Is this technology innovative? Is this a science project? Is this a feature or a product? And I think that when you really look at that in the holistic way and you evaluate in the way that our investment committee is really looking deeply into these opportunities, that is that you come out with a productive outcome and a path to success for these young founders. And our portfolio runs the breadth of pre-seed, seed, series A. That's really where we like to focus because we are able to be part of those companies approaching those dual market opportunities opportunities and that within the government and within commercial markets. And I would also say that, you know, the DOD is not a great customer in the very beginning, particularly for software companies. If you do not have great commercial customer traction on the commercial side, it's going to be a harder sell to the government customer who wants to see that validation. However, if you look to maybe a, a hardware company, that early DOD partner in the testing and evaluation phase and the construction phase is a much better partner because of all of the resources that are available to, say, the Air Force, sure. uh, rather than building the model on your own and then going on as a young company. But so I'll yeah. leave it there. Let me pull on that thread for a moment because I wanted to ask about hardware. One of the other issues besides innovation and startups is just the shrinking defense industrial base, the DIB. Small businesses are maybe getting a bigger share of the money, but there's fewer of them, and there's sole sources for many of the critical parts. What about if a company said, you know, we have a much better way of making gyroscopes, I'm making that up, or roller ball bearings for jet engines, and this technology uses this type of metallurgy instead of that type, this type type of manufacturing process instead of that type. We think we can deliver rollerball bearings to the Air Force maintenance facilities for 30% less than Timken. Again, I'm making this up. But would that also attract, do you think, venture capital nowadays? That's old line hardware metal pounding. Yeah, you know, well, I think uh, it really would depend. Lisa really hit the nail on the head. It really would depend on the team, the confidence in the team. How differentiated is their technology? You mentioned a new process or maybe use new materials. So how significant is that in terms of the performance and cost of what you're looking for? And then what's their path to market? For components like that, probably the path to market is with a prime or major defense contractor. One of the differentiating factors for Shield Capital is we have a strategic partnership with L3 Harris. And so that allows us not only some vast resources for tech due diligence, of companies to see how differentiated their tech is. But also that's the fastest path to government revenue. So L3 Harris already has the contract. So if they have a new vendor to evaluate and that vendor is interested, then they have a quick path to revenue. Different if you're talking about a kind of a finished product versus a component. Okay, well now there's more opportunity to use DIU, uh, AFWorks, other pathways into DOD. And of course, that's where some of us at Shield have some experience and we're able to help a potential portfolio company. Sure, I guess it's easier to make a better chocolate bar. The problem is distribution and shelf space, which is what is going to stop you no yes. matter how good it is. Yes. And 
And, well, I was going to ask the same mistakes that a company or a team would make in trying to sell their product, I'm imagining are similar to the mistakes they make in trying to sell themselves to get money. So what should they do in general better? What's the most common error you see from startups or would-be startups with respect to how they talk to the people that are going to fund 